Adam Hochschild um, has written many books, many different kinds of books. Some about Europe, some about Africa, some about the United States. But the one thing it seems to me that unites his work is his interest in freedom, or at least in the striving of human beings to be free. So Adam, um, what are the words as a writer that you like to associate with democracy and freedom? Uh, I like the word justice because it has both a connotation of equal justice before the law, that everybody is equal before that law. You know, lord and peasant, president and garbage collector, they're all equal. Uh, I like the word freedom in the sense of human rights. Everybody should have the right to speak what they want, to write what they want, to not have that impeded with in any way. Uh, those are some of the words that I associate with democracy. I also think at its best, democracy involves equity. Not that everybody has to be exactly equal economically, but to me the most democratic societies are those where there is the least spread in terms of income, opportunity, and so on. One of the things people most associate with you is your book about the Congo and the terrible cataclysmic uh, Belgium um, colonization, the brutality of that system. When you studied the Congo, you obviously never spoke to many people involved physically, literally, in, in that experience. Uh, do you think that the, the Congolese who were co colonized by, by the Belgians, did they think about rights and justice and freedom in the same way as perhaps the Americans you studied both for your, war, for your book about the First World War, and I know you're working today on, on, on a book about uh, early 20th century history of America? Well, it's hard for me to say what Congolese thought when they were being ruthlessly and brutally conquered and colonized starting about 140 years ago. It's hard for me to say because we have virtually no written records from that time. Uh, one of the things that happens when a people is conquered and conquered ruthlessly in the way that happened in the colonization of Africa is that their voices are snuffed out. They're from the, the, the most brutal period of colonization in the Congo ran from about 1880 to 1920. And demographers estimate that during that time the population of the territory, and that's roughly the same area that's the Democratic Republic of Congo today, was cut roughly in half from about 20 million people at the beginning of that time to 10 million people at the end of that time. We do not have a single autobiography, a single full oral history of a Congolese man or woman during that time. So I can't tell you uh, exactly how they thought, but certainly some of them gave testimony, in some cases many years later, about the tremendous atrocities that were visited upon them as they were, they essentially had a forced labor system imposed on them by King Leopold II of Belgium because this territory was his personal, privately owned colony for 23 years before it became the Belgian Congo. During that time, he amassed an enormous fortune, more than a billion dollars measured by today's American dollars, by essentially turning much of the male population of the territory into forced laborers to gather ivory and wild rubber. And he did that by sending his army into village after village. They would take the women hostage, chain them up, and you can see pictures of them chained up, uh, and hold them for days and sometimes weeks out of each month in order to force the men to go into the rainforest and gather wild rubber. Whilst all this was going on, the horrors of, of the Belgian colonization of Congo, of course, countries like Belgium and many others in Western Europe were experimenting with democracy and presenting themselves as enlightened societies, giving rights perhaps to women, discussing the rights of workers. How did 
your experience of studying the Belgium colonization of the Congo, how did that change your perception of the European Enlightenment and perhaps even the Western European experiment with representative democracy? Well, I don't think it changed my impression because I think I had learned long ago when I was a young man during the Vietnam War that you can have a country that is fairly democratic at home, like the United States, that does horrible things overseas. And of course, looking back through our history, the same thing has been true for a long time. At the same time that Leopold was colonizing the Congo, the United States was f fighting an absolutely ruthless war to colonize the Philippines, 1899 to 1902, when torture was routine. Again, you can see photographs of it. Uh, but, you know, we were a budding democracy here at home. Uh, you know, only 20 years away from giving the vote to women. Unfortunately, a much longer time away from really ensuring the vote to for black people in the South to vote. Um, but I, I think again and again, you find countries that are reasonably democratic at home, uh, that do can do terrible things overseas because they think of the people overseas as other, as people who don't deserve these same rights. So the United States and Vietnam, uh, Europe, Britain, France, you know, reasonably democratic countries, colonizing Africa. Um, I think that kind of disparity you see all through history. It's not just external, of course, it's also internal. Uh, America was experimenting with its own democratic system whilst it clung on, or parts of the country clung on to slavery. How does your reading of, of what happened in the Congo compare to the American experience of slavery? Well, I think there again, there was a contradiction built into the very founding of this country, where we have all these noble documents, you know, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the idea of a balance of power between three branches of government, uh, you know, and these are splendid notions, the ideas of checks and balances, uh, guaranteed freedom of speech. At the same time, as we had millions of enslaved people, uh, you know, work to death under brutal, horrible conditions. It was just that all of these rights and freedoms didn't apply to them. And exactly that same disparity continued to exist, you know, in colonial Africa up until the 1960s when most of the African countries gained their independence. It's ironic, isn't it, that as a writer, your job is partly to look through language, to critique language, to, to look at words like freedom and democracy and rights that were thrown around so liberally in 19th century Europe, and yet also were used in such a, a hypocritical and, and often dishonest way. They were, and I also like to look at times and places where I think even within our own country, uh, even putting aside the issue of slavery and racial discrimination, uh, we didn't live up to those ideals. Uh, I'm working right now on a book about the United States in the period 1917 to 1920, which I think was the most politically repressive time in American history uh, since the end of slavery. Most Americans don't know about it. It tends to get left out of our history books. This was the the most Trumpian time in American history in the sense that people were thundering on all sides about deporting as many immigrants as possible. Uh, people were doing things that Trump would like to do and hasn't been able to do, like censoring the press on a large scale. This began under the First World War, uh, but continued for several years after the war was over. And Americans, you know, like people in most countries, don't like to look at uncomfortable periods of their own past. None of this has convinced you to join the camp of your old college friend Richard Wolff uh, in his more fundamental critique of American capitalism or perhaps capitalism in, in general. What's your interpretation, particularly in terms of the, the work you're, you're focused on at the moment, 
between the inequities of capitalism and the injustices of democracy or the absence of democracy? Well, I, I do fear that for better or worse, we're stuck with capitalism for a long time to come. Uh, I Isn't can that a bit of a cop out there? <laughs> well, let me elaborate on it. I can certainly imagine another economic system that might be more fair. Uh, I can imagine a system where there are not vast concentrations of power in private hands, where, you know, uh, somebody can't amass $50 billion by owning Amazon.com. Uh, and the concentrations of power like that are only growing right now in enormous ways. I can imagine such a system. Uh, I would like to get there, but I have a hard time pointing to examples where a radically different system has worked. Certainly none of the countries that called themselves socialist were in any ways m models that we ought to follow. And I lived for a while in the former Soviet Union to write a book there. Uh, I admire in terms of equity and a fairer sharing of wealth uh, many things that are ha happening in the Nordic countries. And I would love to see us do things like that and carry them further. Adam, much of your work is historical. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, you've, you've not only written about the Congo, but about the Soviet Union. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, early 20th century American history. Um, how do you think 2020 is going to go down in history? Is it going to be one of those pivotal years, 1848, 1917? Mm -hmm. I hope 2020 is going to go down as the year when Americans come to their senses and realize that this country made a terrible mistake in electing Donald Trump uh, president in 2016. Uh, one of the worst mistakes that's ever been made in American history. And let us not forget that, you know, a majority of us did not vote for him due to our absolutely crazy electoral well, system. Well, certainly a majority of us in Berkeley anyway. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but due to our absolutely crazy electoral system, you know, he did not win the popular vote. Uh, but I hope uh, 2020 is going to go down as a year where we, we rectify that, uh, send him back to Trump Tower. Uh, and, you know, I think if we can succeed in doing that, it involves a larger reckoning as well. And it requires a larger reckoning, realizing that it's not just a matter of a large percentage of the electorate having made a mis terrible mistake four years ago, but that there are all kinds of absurdities built into the system that we're living in right now. We have completely abandoned the notion of antitrust laws and other limitations on the gathering of these enormous, enormous fortunes. Uh, I mentioned, you know, Jeff Bezos is on Amazon, but, you know, there are plenty of other people like that as well. In fact, the three wealthiest people in the United States right now, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Warren Buffett, own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of Americans combined. And that is ridiculous. This is more than just an American phenomenon. Would you explain it? basically in terms of the inequities of capitalism, the inequities of globalization, or is there something more profound at work? I think there are a number of things going on there. There, there people are upset. People are upset by inequities, uh, by the visible inequality they can see all around them, which is only growing in almost all parts of the world. They're upset by the way that globalization means an unpredictableness to their lives. You know, corporations, you know, close down a factory in one country and move it somewhere else, and suddenly a job you expected to have all your life has, has disappeared. Um, I think the flow of immigrants and refugees around the world is undoubtedly upsetting to people who suddenly find they have new neighbors who speak languages they don't know, have customs they're not familiar with. Uh, the speed at which technology is changing everything uh, is sometimes upsetting. The fact that 
uh, in the United States at least, uh, you are really sunk, economically speaking, if you don't have a bachelor's degree at least, uh, is deeply unsettling to many people who came from families where for generations there seemed to be a guaranteed job for somebody who knew a craft. So there are all kinds of reasons why people in many different countries are upset. I think one thing all of these authoritarian populists have in common is that they all evoke a glorious past. You know, make America great again. They're all nostalgists. Yeah. They all, they all harken back to yesterday. Yeah. That great yesterday almost always involves the absence of somebody who's causing us trouble today. Mexicans coming over the border, Muslims in India, uh, Syrian refugees who might enter Hungary or Poland, although of course none of them have been allowed in. Uh, it, it, allows, it allows a politician to pin the blame on an outside force to evoke a sort of mythical time in the past when everything was all right. Of course, when you look at that past under a microscope, everything is not all right then, and there were often many people who were getting very badly treated. But for somebody who's feeling all of those discontents for the reasons we talked about in the present, it's comforting to have that past uh, evoked. It's interesting that you mentioned Kapuscinski, of course, who, like you, wrote extensively about Africa and was a master of language. You also mentioned electronic media. As a writer and as somebody very finely tuned in, in using words correctly, uh, are you troubled with the way in which the internet and social media has trivialized and commodified language? You only need to go on, on the internet these days in the, in the age of the coronavirus. To, to read about people who claim their rights and their freedom are being abused because they have to wear masks. They don't understand what these words mm -hmm. mean. Um, so is, is electronic media, is it corrupting language in a, in a kind of profoundly Orwellian way? Well, there certainly is a great deal of nonsense and often really harmful, nox noxious no nonsense that's floating around on the internet. There's no question about that. But actually for my work, uh, I spend a lot of time looking at old newspapers from a hundred years ago. And there was a lot of nonsense in them. Uh, <laughs> so I think, you know, human beings have always had a tremendous capacity to uh, spread lies, to spread untruths, to spread myths about people that they don't like and that that's been happening in one form or another. It happens more quickly, it happens instantaneously with the, the internet. Uh, in the days of newspapers, which I feel sort of nostalgic for because I began my career as a newspaper reporter, you know, it took at least overnight to get untruths out there across the country. Now it happens, you know, in an instant. But uh, I, I don't think those times in the past had any monopoly on a greater degree of truth than we do. Electronic media, of course, is, is extremely global. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are, you have access to Facebook and Twitter and Google. But in your analysis of, um, of, of democracy and of freedom around the world, is there a gulf opening up between the United States and the rest of the world, particularly Europe? Are they on separate paths, separate trajectories now when it comes to the protection and development of freedom? You mentioned the Scandinavian model, which you, uh, which, which, uh, you would like us to be moving towards. But isn't Scandinavia and perhaps Germany going one way and America quite a different way? Well, I greatly hope America is going to make a turnaround later this year. And You're relying on one election, Adam? <laughs> Can we it's rely on that? No, it's going to take much more than that. But uh, I don't know. I, I see the United States really bifurcating in itself. You know, here we are talking in California, uh, which feels to me a different country from, you know, states like Louisiana, Texas, uh, you know, uh, Appalachia, Alabama, I was in Alabama for a week in November. Um, 
we have this bifurcation within our own country and of course you've got it within Europe too because there's this you know growing right-wing party in Germany there are similar forces in Scandinavia and France and other countries I think the bifurcation is everywhere so you don't really see any difference between Europe and the United States when it comes to the corruption of democracy well Europe has not been quite as nonsensical as we've been about dealing with the coronavirus. Uh, and I'm talking about the nonsense on the national level, the leadership uh, or lack of leadership that Trump has given. Uh, only in England, uh, and to some extent in, in Italy, was there a similar kind of gross disregard of the basic precautions from, from the beginning. Um, one thing that is interesting though where I think there is a real gulf opening up is that I don't see in Europe anything like the principled denial of global warming that affects a large part of the American political spectrum. Uh, that to me is one of the most dangerous things in this country right now because of course the denialists are at the moment in control of the government. Uh, and to be denying such a basic scientific set of facts with such ominous implications for all of us, I think is really dangerous. You know, I can't say that all of U Europe has moved, you know, dramatically farther forward towards alternative energy, but at least you don't have a kind of principled denialism of it that we have here. But you can be a climate denialist and be in favor of democracy, can't you? In theory, I guess you can, yeah. And I think probably most climate denialists would tell you that they do believe in, in, in democracy. Uh, but it's still a scary thing to me when people deny science. But the biggest challenge in America is the undermining of rights itself, of voting rights, as you say. Mm -hmm of perhaps even the right to free speech? Well, that's certainly a major challenge, although I think in a way I'm a little more worried about uh, other things. I think I, I don't fear the disappearance of free speech in this country as much as I do the disappearance of checks and balances on those in power. The fact that uh, Trump, for instance, seems to have absolutely uh, no interest in the idea of the Justice Department, the court system, as a separate branch of government. Uh, and that to me is one of the things that ought to be the essence of American democracy, that everybody is equal before the law, whether you're a Trump crony or anybody else. Um, I got to say, I think I fear the effects of climate denialism uh, almost more than anything else. Finally, Adam, uh, we talked about your work as a writer. You, you make your living with words. Uh, and you're also a man who spent his career uh, defending democracy and the right to freedom. What words or books should be central in, in a good democratic education? Oh my goodness, there are so many books that uh, I hardly know where to begin. Um, I, I don't know, I, I have a great appreciation for literature and I think I'd almost start there. Uh, for me, um, I would have a hard time explaining theoretically why this is so. But I think if you can appreciate the contradictions in human nature that are highlighted by great writers like Tolstoy and Shakespeare and so forth, uh, you're going to be more open to understanding the contradictions in human nature that democracy tries to acknowledge with its system of checks and balances uh, and to protect and enhance. Uh, 
I would hate to prescribe particular writers that one ought to read. I have my favorites, of course. Uh, I think I would put Tolstoy in fiction and Orwell in nonfiction at the top of the list. Um, Orwell was certainly somebody who thought a great deal about democracy and who had the wisdom to see and understand the three great tyrannies, <coughs> three great tyrannies of his era, Soviet communism, uh, fascism, where he went to Spain to fight in the Civil War against fascism, and colonialism, where he worked as a police officer uh, in British colonial Burma, saw colonialism for what it was, repudiated it. And I admire the expansiveness of his understanding of these three terrible systems, and I think that's what gave him his great appreciation for democracy.